So let's begin uh, part two of chapter two with a review of valence shells. So remember valence shells are the outermost electron shell uh, in an atom. The electrons in there are called valence electrons. Electrons like to reside in pairs, but they don't pair up until there are at least four electrons in that outer shell. And then any unpaired electrons are going to be the electrons that are involved in a chemical reaction. And the number of unpaired electrons in the valence shell is called the bonding capacity. So if you look at carbon there, carbon has four unpaired electrons. That means carbon is willing to form up to four bonds. And in fact, carbon is often forms four bonds. If it has any unpaired electrons, it likes to grab a hydrogen. Um, and those bonds can be either single, double, or triple bonds, depending on the atom and how many valence electrons are available. We already talked about nitrogen. He's got three uh, valence electrons that are going to form a bond. Oxygen has two. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon are often bonded with hydrogen. Um, and then if you look down at the bottom, silicon, phosphorus, and sulfur, you can see a variety of uh, different numbers of unpaired electrons. This time though, in the third electron shell. So remember we said that electrons fill the shells um, up before they move to the next one. So carbon has two electrons in its inner shell, four in its outer shell. Nitrogen has another electron, so it's got five in its outer shell. Once you get all eight in the outer shell, you move to a new shell. So uh, silicon has two in the first, eight in the second, and then four in the third, so on until you fill up uh, that third shell. So those electrons like to be involved in chemical reactions. So let's talk a little bit about what a chemical reaction is. A chemical reaction is simply the making or breaking of chemical bonds. When this happens, you get emergent properties. You get uh, a change from individual atoms to a compound made up of multiple atoms. And in this case, we have a really simple reaction. This is the formation of hydrogen, I'm sorry, the formation of water from hydrogen and oxygen. So we start with two molecules of hydrogen. Uh, those silver balls and bars are uh, hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms bonded together. That uh, line in the center, that stick in the center is indicating the presence of a bond. Those are two shared electrons. So hydrogen is sharing uh, one electron each with another hydrogen uh, atom to produce a hydrogen molecule. The oxygen there is shown in red uh, with uh, two bars across. That indicates a double bond. And um, those are our two reactants. So on the left side of our screen, we have our reactants. Those are our starting molecules. Then we have that big arrow in the middle that indicates that a reaction is happening. And we are moving from our reactants to our products. So on the right-hand side, we have two molecules of water. Those are the final molecules or the product of this chemical reaction. And you'll notice that all of the molecules in the reactants are all of the atoms in the reactants are accounted for in the products. They don't disappear. Matter doesn't disappear. Um, it is just rearranged in these chemical reactions. So the bonds are broken between the hydrogen and between the oxygens, and they are reformed between uh, hydrogen and oxygen to form water. Uh, chemical reactions are all different. They all depend on the properties of the individual atom or the individual molecule um, and how they interact with uh, the other reactants in the equation. Uh, chemical reactions are generally reversible. That means you can uh, mix your products, I'm sorry, your reactants together to make your products and your products can be broken down back into the reactions. Um, the concentration of the reactants is going to determine the reaction rate. So some reactions are going to happen really quickly. Others are going to happen really slowly. Um, and you can often change the reaction rate by increasing um, one or more of the reactants. So if you have more hydrogen and more nitrogen there, um, there's a better chance of those molecules meeting 
in uh, whatever reaction vessel you have, whether it's a cell or um, a beaker on the table, if you have more of them, it's more likely that they're going to interact and form the products. Um, eventually, a chemical reaction is going to reach chemical equilibrium. At this point, the reaction appears to stop. But really, the reaction doesn't stop. Chemical equilibrium means that that reaction that goes forward uh, from products to reactants uh, goes at a particular rate, and it slows down as your products accumulate and your reactants decrease. Um, but as I said a minute ago, your products can also break down into your reaction. So as that reaction is going forward, it's also going backwards. And a chemical reaction appears to stop, um, but it doesn't. It reaches something called chemical equilibrium, and that is where the reaction going forward producing the products is happening at an equal rate to the reaction going backwards uh, producing the reactants. Um, and this is true for all chemical reactions. Um, I shouldn't say all. Most chemical reactions will not go to completion. Um, there are definitely reactions that do go to completion and don't go back. But in general, we're going to say that um, they go, they reach chemical equilibrium. So where the forward reaction uh, essentially equals the backward reaction. And this is really important in um, biological reactions. Um, and the cell can actually uh, control the, the concentrations of reactants um, and the concentrations of the products can affect the reaction, the, meta the reaction rate of metabolic processes in our body. So most of the processes in our body actually reach chemical equilibrium. They don't go to completion, um, but they do tend to slow down as you use up your reactants and produce your products. So now that we've talked a little bit about reaction rates, let's talk about what's actually happening in a chemical reaction. There's a variety of things that could happen, I and mean, that relates to the type of chemical bond that is formed. So there are four major types of bonds that we are worried about in biology. Um, the first two are covalent bonds. There are two types of those, nonpolar and polar covalent. So we'll talk about uh, each of those types. Then we have an ionic bond and a hydrogen bond. And all of these uh, types of reactions, all of these uh, types of chemical bonds um, play an important role in our biological molecules. So covalent bonds are a chemical bond that results from the sharing of electrons. So remember we said that the atomic core has protons and neutrons, and those protons are positively charged, and they attract the negatively charged electrons. And those protons don't really want to give up those electrons, um, and so they hold on to them. They keep them in their shells. But because electrons are negatively charged and because there are other atoms with positively charged protons and because electrons like to stay in pairs, we often find the sharing of electrons between two atoms. So this example shows hydrogen with its one electron and its one electron shell. Um, and down on the bottom, we see this sharing, this single bond between two hydrogen molecules. So now we have uh, two, sorry, two hydrogen atoms producing one hydrogen molecule. Those two shared electrons indicate a single bond. Um, you can also share four electrons, which is a double bond. That's two bonds formed between electrons. So the diagram on the right shows uh, what is happening with those electrons. So remember we said that electrons reside in sort of a cloud. They're in a cloud buzzing around our protons. And they are negatively charged, so they want to stay with their own proton. But they're also attracted to that proton of the other hydrogen atom. So we see that yellow cloud, and that's to indicate those electrons that are moving. They're buzzing around. They're constantly moving within their shell. They don't stop. Um, but they are also attracted to that other hydrogen next to it. And so 
what we see happening is that even though those though those electrons are constantly moving and buzzing around their own hydrogen, they spend a little bit more time in the area between. They spend a little bit more time being attracted to the other proton. And so we get this movement of this cloud toward the neighboring hydrogen molecule. And because of that positive negative attraction between the protons and the electrons, we get those hydrogen molecules sort of sticking together. They're sharing their electrons because those electrons like to be paired and because they're attracted to the other atomic core. So we see some different uh, covalent bonds here. Um, Hydrogen uh, is a very common uh, molecule that we find. Hydrogen doesn't like to hang out by itself. It's got a free, or sorry, it's got a single electron it likes to share. So we've got hydrogen there. Then we've got oxygen. That's another molecule, another element that likes to hang out together. It, oxygen forms a double bond with itself. I'm sorry, there's something weird with my uh, image here. We've got an extra oxygen bubble there. But um, you can see a couple of different uh, ways that oxygen is represented. represented. Um, we see the electron distribution diagram there that shows the shells, the electrons, and the sharing of four electrons. So that's our double bond there. Each pair of electrons constitutes one bond. We've got the structural formula, which is the most simplified way that we draw these molecules. Um, and then we've got our space filling molecule that just shows um, the atom as a whole and how it uh, sort of fits with the other molecules. Oh, we've got water down there. Again, oxygen likes to form two bonds. It also likes to hang out with hydrogen. Uh, water is probably the most important molecule that we're going to talk about today. Um, and that's because water makes up such a huge proportion of our bodies and such a huge proportion of any cell and of our planet. So we've got uh, oxygen there hanging out with two hydrogens. If you'll recall from the beginning of the first uh, chapter one video, um, I said that oxygen was really electronegative. So that means that it really likes to pull negative charges. It really likes to pull electrons towards itself. It has a strong affinity for electrons. And so it actually causes that cloud, that electron cloud, to hang out more with oxygen, to hang out more with itself and less with hydrogen. And that's going to be really important in a few minutes. Then down on the bottom we have methane. This is an example of a carbon molecule. Remember carbon has four electrons in its uh, valence shell. That means it wants to for form four bonds. We often find carbon bonded with itself and with hydrogen. So um, carbon likes to form big long chains with other carbon molecules and with hydrogens and uh, those will become important when we get to chapter 3. Um, here we have uh, just a quick reminder of the difference between elements and compounds. We've got um, hydrogen and oxygen elements and then down on the bottom we have uh, water and methane which are compounds. So remember that compounds are uh, a, a mixture of different types of uh, elements. So I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, I reminded you a minute ago that oxygen uh, is very electronegative. Um, and this is important because a lot of atoms will share their electrons to varying degrees. Some of them really like to share their electrons, others really don't. Others don't care to share their electrons. Um, so remember, electronegativity is just how strong the attraction is uh, of an atom for an electron. So nitrogen and oxygen are very electronegative. They like to form bonds. They like to attract other uh, electrons to them. And if they don't have something to bond to, they'll bond to hydrogen. So part of this electronegativity um, is how likely an atom is to share its electrons. And from that, we get two types of covalent bonds. One is a nonpolar covalent bond. The other is a polar covalent bond. We'll talk about polar covalent bonds in a minute. Nonpolar covalent bonds occur when two atoms uh, share their electrons equally. 
And really the only time you get a true equal sharing is when it's the same element bonded to itself. So oxygen bound to oxygen, although each oxygen is highly electronegative, um, they really are sharing equally. They're both attracting the electrons equally uh, toward one another. Um, so another way to think of a not, the definition of a nonpolar bond is that two atoms of the same element pull electrons equally. So anytime you have two elements bonded to each other, you're going to get a nonpolar bond. So oxygen to oxygen, hydrogen to hydrogen, carbon to carbon, nitrogen, nitrogen, and so on. Um, oxygen form, likes to form a double bond uh, with itself. Carbon will form either single or double bonds uh, with itself, uh, depending on the molecule. Um, Nonpolar bonds are uh, by nature not found between two different molecules, but you can have um, essentially nonpolar bonds where you have two uh, molecules that are very similar in electronegativity uh, bound to one another. So you can have um, say carbon and nitrogen, um, although technically are probably pulling slightly differently, um, they may essentially have the same pull. Um, but generally nonpolar bonds are found between two atoms of the same, uh, two of the same atoms. Um, when we talk about carbon, uh, carbon likes to form nonpolar bonds with itself. So you can get these huge chains of carbon molecules. I think I already mentioned that. Um, and that gives a molecule a largely nonpolar uh, region and nonpolar characteristics. And that'll become important when we start talking about water and um, uh, various interactions that happen. But um, you can have not only nonpolar uh, bonds, but you can have nonpolar regions and nonpolar characteristics as well, and that'll become important shortly. Our other type of covalent bond is a polar covalent bond. So this is when an atom is bonded to a more electronegative atom. Um, that means that one of the atoms is pulling electrons toward itself more strongly than the other one can. Um, so I like to sort of think of uh, polar and nonpolar bonds as a tug of war. A nonpolar bond is going to be a tug of war between two perfectly matched individuals. Uh, you have a rope in the middle and they're both pulling and nothing is happening because they're equally matched. In a polar covalent bond, um, you might have a, a big strong guy and a little tiny weak guy pulling and so the 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 weaker uh, half of that tug of war is being pulled towards the other one. Um, and electronegativity is the same way that generally oxygen, uh, also very common as nitrogen, are pulling those atoms, uh, sorry, electrons very strongly towards their center. And what happens when these electrons are pulled toward the center is that we get these partially charged molecules. So oxygen is very electronegative, and we see that indicated by those yellow arrows there. That means that it is pulling electrons away from hydrogen. That means that electrons are spending more time around the oxygen, and because of that, their charge is spending more time around the oxygen. So we get this region, the region around the oxygen becomes more negatively charged than the regions with the hydrogen. Because the electrons are moving away from hydrogen, those regions are more positively charged. And so water, um, because it is a polar molecule, because it is positively charged in some regions and negatively charged in others, has some very specific, very cool properties, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, here's a quick video I'm going to start for you. This is a video from our book. Um, it is kind of a dry video. <laughs> um, it's not too exciting, but I do want to show you because it shows you how um, polar and nonpolar bonds uh, form between two atoms. A covalent bond is the sharing of a pair of outer shell electrons by two atoms. For example, each of these hydrogen atoms has one electron in its outer shell, but needs two electrons to complete its outer shell. If the two hydrogen atoms share electrons, they can both complete their outer shells. 
The shared pair of electrons constitutes a covalent bond, shown in shorthand as a line. The covalently bonded hydrogen atoms form a molecule of hydrogen gas. A molecule is defined as two or more atoms held together by covalent bonds. An oxygen atom needs two electrons to complete its outer shell. Two oxygen atoms can share two pairs of electrons. A molecule of oxygen gas is held together by a double covalent bond, two shared pairs of electrons. A carbon atom needs four electrons to complete its outer shell. It can share electrons with four hydrogen atoms, forming a methane molecule containing four single covalent bonds. Methane is a compound, a substance formed by the combination of two or more elements. We call methane natural gas. It is the fuel burned in gas stoves and furnaces. An oxygen atom needs two additional electrons to fill its outer shell. Thus it can form two single covalent bonds. An oxygen atom can share electrons with two hydrogen atoms, forming a molecule of water containing two single covalent bonds. So let's move on to our next type of uh, bond or compound, and that is ionic compounds. So the ionic quote-unquote bond is actually an attraction. So in our polar molecules, electrons are shared, whether equally or unequally. And that means that electrons are spending roughly, uh, or are, although still attracted to both electrons, are being shared, sorry, between two atoms are being shared between them. In an ionic compound, two atoms um, interact in a way that um, is basically completely unequal. One atom will completely take an electron from the other. Um, and this produces something called an ion. There are two types of ions. Um, and an ion is simply a charged molecule. So when you form an ionic bond, um, you produce one negatively charged ion and one positively charged ion. So in our diagram here, sodium has three electron shells. It has one electron in its outer shell, which it wants to pair up. That electron wants to find a pair or an, another electron to form a pair and because there's only one in that outer shell the bonding capacity is one. Chlorine on the other hand is so electronegative that it doesn't even share its electron with sodium. It actually strips it away from sodium leaving that empty shell um, on the sodium ion. When that happens Sodium, because it has lost an electron, it has lost some negative charge, becomes positively charged. It now has a positive charge of plus one. There are more protons than there are electrons. Chlorine has stripped that electron, pulled it away, and has now completed its valence shell. It also had a bonding capacity of one. But when it did that, it gained an electron. So now it has an extra electron compared to its protons, which means that it's positively charged. So now our chlorine ion has a plus one charge. So remember a compound is um, a substance made up of more than one element. Um, and keep in mind that ionic compounds are attracted, not bound. So they're not sharing electrons. But because the sodium is positively charged, and because the chlorine is negatively charged, they attract one another. The sodium continues to hang out around the chlorine because of that positive charge. It's attracted to that negative charge in the chlorine. Um, ionic compounds are often arranged in what we call a 3D lattice structure. So this is a regular structure. You can see those alternating chlorine and nitrogen atoms. And that's because you have this positive charge that wants to be around as many negative charges as possible. And so they sort of fit together in this nice pattern. Um, ionic compounds are often called salts. Remember we talked about sodium chloride already in the beginning of the chapter. Um, and one thing that you probably already know about salts is that they're soluble in water. 
So um, I'd like you to pause for a second and think about why a salt is soluble in water. Think about the properties that I talked about when we talked about that polar compound uh, and we used water as an example and then the uh, properties of these ionic compounds. I'm not going to stop. I just want you to pause and think for a minute and think about whether or not you can figure out why they're soluble in water. Hopefully you thought about that for a minute. Um, if you didn't, I'm going to tell you. If you did, we'll see if you're right. Um, so remember, our polar molecule has a partially charged region, um, which means that some of the molecule is negative and some of it's positive. Salts are soluble in water because their ions are also positive and negatively charged. So what happens is that the sodium ions are attracted to the negative region of the water also. And the chlorine ions are attracted to the positive region of the water also. And so the water sort of disrupts this interaction between sodium and chloride. Here's another video um, that shows what happens to the electrons in this interaction. Sometimes atoms complete their outer shells by stealing or giving away electrons. This happens between sodium and chlorine atoms. An electron moves from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom. The outer shells of both atoms are now complete, containing eight electrons. The chlorine atom now has 18 electrons, but only 17 protons. Because an electron has a negative charge, the chlorine atom now has a net negative charge. Such a charged atom or molecule is called an ion, in this case, a negative ion. The sodium atom has lost an electron, leaving it with an extra proton, which has a positive charge. The sodium atom has become a positive ion. Ions with opposite charges are attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. These ions combine to form a compound with new properties. In this case, sodium chloride, ordinary table salt, is formed. 